In the transition from generation two to three, Spikes and its adjacent components change a lot. Spikes now has multiple layers, up to three, dealing 25%. Uh, there's also the introduction of abilities, which means uh, with Levitate, first of all, you no longer have to be a flying type to not be affected by Spikes. That's really big. Uh, the second ability relevant to Spikes is Sandstream because that really hammers home the damage Spikes does. Uh, I'll try not to make this into a Sandstream component uh, because we are focusing on Spikes in this video and there's a whole video about passive damage I have which mostly focuses on sand. But the point is, uh, in GSC then, if you stick around with lefties, you'll heal off Spikes damage. Now, if you're not sand immune, uh, sorry, Suicune switches in with sand up, takes one layer of Spikes, and that 12.5% is sticking. And that is a really, really big deal. And this is why a lot of uh, the advanced OU metagame and viability is warped around uh, immunity to one of sand or Spikes because uh, they work in tandem so well together. The few Pokemon that are immune to both, incredible. But generally, if you can avoid being affected by one, that's fine. For example, uh, something like Zapdos is affected by sand, but it's not affected by spikes. Something like Metagross is affected by spikes, but not by sand. And therefore, they are both solid in the ways of longevity. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that if you are affected by both, then you can't have longevity. Uh, for example, Celebi doesn't quite have that problem uh, because it has Recover. But it can still be annoying, and if you don't have instant recovery, like in the case of something like Suicune, then that's going to be one of your biggest flaws. So, uh, the abilities are another big difference, and the biggest difference of all uh, perhaps, anyway, is that Skarmory now gets spikes. So you have one of the best walls in the game, which has approximately a billion free turns per battle because it switches into everything, and it's now going to stack multiple layers of spikes and phase you around. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, and for this reason, then a lot of teams, uh, we have to mention Magneton in this spike section, not because Magneton deals with spikes, but because by dealing with Skarmory and Foragers if it runs HP Fire, which it usually does, uh, then it's used as spikes control. You're KOing the wall and you're limiting them so they can't get three layers of spikes, number one, and so they can't stick around and abuse those spikes further. Like, yeah, Skarmory can get one layer, maybe two layers, because two layers isn't that much stronger than one layer, because it only goes up to, I believe it's 16.67% uh, uh, is the second layer, which isn't that much of a jump up from 12.5. I mean, it's nice, obviously. It's either that or 15. I've been out of the loop for a while. But there's a general uh, saying, or accepted knowledge among good players, is that uh, if you're going for the second layer of spikes, you should probably be able to get the third with some degree of certainty, or maybe you could be doing something better with that turn, because the second layer of spikes is not that much of an upgrade. If it, I mean, it's not bad, obviously. More spikes damage? No. No, thank you. I want to do less with my spikes. No one's saying that. But in the case of Skarmory, then maybe you'd be better off using Whirlwind on that turn, uh, if you can't get the third. Um, if it's a close game, obviously. If it's going to be a blowout and Skarmory walls their entire team, then it doesn't really matter. So, uh, But yeah, so then we have uh, Magneton to limit them from getting those three layers and from Skarmory from uh, sitting around and walling entire portions of teams. And uh, one of the cool things about Cloyster as a spiker in Gen 3 is that it is not weak to Magneton. So it can really... Uh, annoy teams that rely on mag to uh, limit the number of spikes layers they're supposed to be contending with. So, uh, how does Skarm lay its spikes? Well, most commonly with a specially defensive spread, because this mean, makes it impossible to KO. Because uh, in the old days of advance, uh, by the way, that's another video I have to make, history of advance OU, or modern history of advance OU. Uh, so many videos to make, it's crazy. So, um, 
I look forward to that one. Yeah, I'm just here dropping trailers in the middle of the movie. Uh, so Skarm in the old days used to run more physically defensive spreads. Some players used to run Jolly Skarm even to get another layer of spikes on Magneton uh, before it was KO'd. But that made it easy to hit Skarm really hard with things like Metagross HP Fire or Swampert Hydro Pump. And when you run specially defensive Skarm, then those things just kind of bounce off. I mean, it's not immortal because it doesn't have Roost. So, But it, with Protect uh, to function as recovery, uh, and again, I have a video on the power of Protect, which touches on this very subject, uh, then it can still be... You know, when you're doing things that range in the 30s, then suddenly it feels like you're not doing any damage at all. Uh, and that's why getting rid of Skarm the wall is so valuable and why the Magneton is so big. Because it's not just that it spikes, because there are other Pokemon that can spike. It's the fact that it sticks around forever and abuses those spikes with Whirlwind. Uh, so, uh, I will mention now, by the way, that uh, I cover a lot of overlapping topics. And uh, one of the in the previous video, then we mentioned how uh, in advan in GSCOU there are only two common Pokemon, Zapdos and Skarmory, that are immune to spikes. So the idea of building a spikes immune team doesn't really exist. I certainly tried. I think Fear did a couple times as well. But your options are really limited. And in advance, that uh, strategy is a lot more viable. It's called the Superman style because you, you fly over the spikes. And I will not be covering that in depth in this video because I have a video called Superman in Advance OU which does that. So I wanted to mention that now. Anyway, so Skarm started spiking in a specially defensive guise to help uh, bounce. Because it takes physically, physical attacks well anyway. Because uh, there comes a point, even if you are running physically defensive Skarmory, which you definitely can uh, and should sometimes, then there comes to a point where it's overkill. Like if you're running max defense, you can pretty much run 216 EVs and not lose much at all, whereas those 40 uh, special defense EVs you gain, uh, or speed EVs if you're trying to beat other Skarms to the Whirlwind, then those are going to be much more significant. So, But there is a, a point to physically defensive Skarm, because uh, another tactic that offensive teams use to try and limit Skarm's uh, spikes is Skarm is usually the first switch to Metagross, because you don't want to go to the bulky water in case it gets blown up because, or like usually the Swampert, because then there goes your rock resist and T-Tar and Aerodactyl are going to cleave you open. Uh, so usually it's going to be Skarm and CB Explosion, Oko's uh, specially defensive Skarm. So that way they, ideally you get it on the switch, they don't get any spikes at all. So, uh, yeah. And then your offensive team is under a lot less pressure because spikes especially in conjunction with sand which they almost always are paired put things on timers a lot more ruthlessly now than in gsc where it's like okay in in gsc it's more in conjunction with spikes i can get my offensive attack going whereas in advance then sand and spikes together almost do the work for you because they punish your opponent for switching so severely potentially obviously against a well-built team uh, you can't entirely rely on uh, passive damage to do the work for you in advance because there are plenty of teams, uh, including but not limited to Superman teams, uh, with tax tactics like Refresh as well, which will punish you for doing that. You have to have some sort of offense you can generate beyond that. But Sand and Spikes do a lot of the work for you and push a lot of offense over the edge. Uh, in the last video, we spoke about offense that synergizes well with Spikes. So uh, something like Skarm is immune to Sand and Spikes, but it certainly gets destroyed by Zapdos' Thunderbolt. And the Pokemon that Skarmory switches out to, uh, again Zapdos, Skarm switches out, goes to Blissey, affected by both Sand and Spikes. Uh, so, and that's why Sand and Spikes are such good complements to Zapdos, because they directly attack its counters. Uh, Blissey is another one of those Pokemon affected by Sand and Spikes, where it doesn't seem to slow it down at all, by the way. Uh, it's almost an exception to the rule, and that's because it takes so little damage from its targets. 
uh, that it is a lot more flexible in that regard. More on that in the Superman thing, because Blissey pops up on Superman teams a lot. Anyway, so Scar, especially defensive guys. Spikes, Whirlwind, Protect, Toxic, the classic. You can start the throwing in moves like Taunt to prevent other spikes, but if you're using Taunt Scar, it's more to delay other spikes early game than to use it as an outright prevention method. And uh, with Taunt Scar, then you usually want to do things like Dragon, Blissey, and prevent it from healing. Uh, because if you have to have a plan to deal with spikes more concretely, because uh, in GSC you can just if you have a good team you're just kind of be playing around it. Whereas in advance, uh, a lot of by the by at this point we're so we have the standards of advance so ingrained in us that we don't even think about it, and we know a good team will naturally handle spikes. But then you start uh, trying to mess around with some lesser seen stuff that you don't see as much and then you see that's why it's not used as much oh because spikes you know this collapses under that pressure so uh, the Skarmory's other options like drill peck are mostly uh, to help it get its spikes going in spikes wars because of course rapid spin does exist so uh, things like drill peck uh, because protect toxic Skarmory had such a stranglehold on the metagame for so long that you started seeing more Fortress, which of course uh, that Skarm set can't touch. So Refresh Claydol, which even uh, better because it's immune to spikes, so if Skarm gets a layer that doesn't affect it. Whereas with Fortress, some sort of pressure can be exerted on it by teammates, you know, spin blocking with Gengar, Pursuit Chip from Titar. That was a favorite tactic of mine. So Drill Peck started uh, popping up to hit Fori and Scar and Claydol, because if there's one thing that Skarm will beat you in in a long... in uh, yeah try that again. If there is one thing Skarm will beat you in every time, it's a long game. So Skarm was like, oh, well, well if Fori and Claydol want to try and outlast me, then I will show them just how impossible that is. And then you have things like, oh, well, Starmie is recovery and natural cure, or recover and natural cure, and then Skarm is like, okay, well, you're also affected by sand, affected by spikes, and especially defensive and toxic, then, you know, bulky Starmie is sent running for the hills. And then your anti-spikes method doesn't work. And, and this is why a lot of teams prefer to just deal with spikes in some way rather than going to extreme ends to try and remove them. Because if you do that, either you overextend yourself trying to contain spikes and then have a very flawed team, uh, which was seen in the Magdal craze of a couple years ago where players were so terrified of the prospect of dealing with spikes that they would dedicate, like, half their team or you know two-thirds of their team to getting rid of the spiker and then ensuring the spin would be pulled off just so they wouldn't have to deal with spikes and those teams were incredibly flawed just ripped open by half the offensive metagame uh yeah so rather than try to do stuff like that uh either you go too far and your team is flawed or your anti spike or your rapid spinner is going to get beaten by Skarm anyway because Skarm is just that good. You know, rather than do that, you can just try and deal with spikes. And that doesn't mean uh, have uh, a fully spikes immune team because that's just as restrictive. Those uh, uh, Pokemon tend to gel better together and have more synergy, but of course it's not the only way. Uh, it's more about having a game plan that you can execute in the face of spikes. So. Uh, and that's just a lot of what good advance offense is about. So, uh, yeah, so that's Skarm. Oh, there's also the YOLO Skarm, which is HP ground to pop up with Mag to deal with Magneton. But then Mag started adapting, and then YOLO Skarm kind of died out. Because if Mag's going to adapt, then you may as well just run the good Skarm sets uh, and make the most of it. There's also other cool stuff Skarm likes to do to get rid of Mag. Uh, like being paired with Dugtrio, or more commonly with its own Magneton. Or sorry, sorry, not not more commonly, more safely with its own Magneton because uh, Mag is a lot easier to pivot into games than Dugtrio. Skarm Dug is the more common pairing for sure, but a uh, Skarm Mag is easier to do double switches with uh, because, like, you can pivot it into Metagross, for example. Uh, whereas if you try to pivot Dug into Metagross, then that can go very badly. Uh, it's a lot riskier. So. Yeah, Skarm is the center of advanced spikes, but it is not the only part of advanced spikes, of course. And whether it's using special defense or it's running physical defense to survive that CB Metagross boom, uh, which is very good, actually, and provide teammates with some more backup against DD Tar and things like that, then, uh, or going fast, because uh, fast Skarm is good in general. 
so th then it can do whatever it wants. And it's all about either enhancing the effects of spike, its own spikes, i.e. taunt to prevent recovery, or ensuring that it will be able to get those spikes, uh, such as Drill Peck for long games against Fori and Claydol. And obviously you can have teammates to try and outlast Skarm, because yeah, Skarm is probably not going to outlast like 16 Pokemon by itself, but uh, there is going to be a... Um, but Skarm also has teammates, which is the thing, like its best friend Gengar. So, yeah, Skarm is the definitive piece. And then we move on to Fori, who spikes and spins. So why don't people like Fori as much? Uh, well, like in GSC, Fori has that nasty 4 times fire weakness, and it's very slow. And uh, so we're not going to reiterate that a million times. And uh, it's also affected by spikes. So, you know, having a spinner affected by spikes, which most of them are, is kind of obnoxious. But, of course, that sandstorm immunity goes such a long way, uh, and it can spike, it can do a lot of other cool things, uh, mostly boom. It can actually function as a pretty good check to Metagross that can actually hurt it back, because if Skarmory wants to actually hurt Metagross back, it has to run counter, which is a good move, but hard to fit. Whereas Fori doesn't really have a problem with running Earthquake, which it can also run to mess up Magneton really badly. And it can live HP fire uh, from not. It, it always runs HP, f always lives HP fire from non max special attack mag. And even max special attack mag doesn't exactly. Have, it's like 18.8% to KO or something. So EQ, boom. Uh, it can also dominate Claydol one on one with HP bug. And then you start getting into the move slot syndrome. So in many ways, Fori is very similar to uh, its GSC counterpart. And like GSC, where players started pairing Fori with Starmie to uh, alleviate the pressure Fori felt while trying to spike and spin, which is definitely you know the case in advance, especially with those multiple layers really putting the clamp down on it. Then in advance, uh, players started pairing Fori with Claydol to do the same thing. Yeah. And when you start doing that, then the question is always, okay, well, the advantage Fori has over Skarm is to spin. And if you're not doing that, then why aren't you using Skarm? Because Skarm is unequivocally, inequivocally, oh my god. This is, uh, I really need to eat. I haven't eaten today. <laughs> unequivocally. I can't believe it fell out of my head like that. Point being, Skarm is unequivocally uh, a better wall. And it can also deal with setup sweepers much better than Fori, who really has to hope it has the right move. Because uh, it can't always fit, like, yeah, it can explode on something like a DD Mens, but if it doesn't have explosion, like a lot of sets don't, then w you're not doing anything to it. Whereas nothing sets up on Skarm safely because of Whirlwinds. Even something like a Taunt DD Gyarados loses to Skarm because Skarm does uh, a pretty hefty chunk to it with Struggle in Sand, obviously. So, yeah, Skarm's phasing is a big deal. Whereas you can, even if you're not countering DD Tar by, with Skarm, which you're not, then you're delaying it and helping your team play around it. Whereas Fortress a lot, struggles a lot more with it. So the answer isn't just if you're not spinning with it, don't use Fori. But it is, you do have to ask yourself, why are you using Fori? And the answer uh, for why people like to use Fori alongside Claydol is that Fori has a very cool move pool in order to ensure spikes. So whereas Skarm can sometimes be annoyed by teams trying to outlast it, Fori with HP Bug directly threatens Claydol. Uh, with EQ, uh, or with HP Fire, it can directly threaten other Fori. Uh, HP Bug also threatens Bulky Starmie more directly, which is very nice. Uh, it can also do really cool stuff like, like run Zap Cannon. Uh, which sounds ridiculous, but if you hit Gengar with it, obviously Gengar is Fortress's worst nemesis, then it's ruined. Uh, you mess up Skarm really badly too, uh, and it's just generally a nice move to have. You can run HP Ghost to keep that hit on Claydol and Starmie. You're not going to be hitting Starmie as much, uh, and so you're probably going to need some help against bulky Starmie, because you're not winning that one-on-one. -on -one. But against Claydol, you're effectively the same. And you also hit Gengar on the switch, so it's really nice. And... Point being that having to choose this hidden power and EQ and boom and zap cannon and counter, those are already hard enough to fit with three slots. And when you have spikes and spin and you have to fit those into two, then it's uh, then a kind of, you know, it's rough. So having that support from Claydol, which is a great Pokemon in its own right, is really helpful. Because it's not like it's just, oh, well, I need a rapid spinner. 
uh, so I'm going to stick on clay at all, I guess. No, they are just very good together. But the point is, for he spikes and spins, but it and it's good at spiking, but it's not as good at spiking at, as Skarmory. Uh, and uh, it's also less specially bulky, uh, which is, you know, has a little more HP, but also less special defense. So the Swampert Hydro Pump can really sting it. Uh, but yeah, that's something to keep in mind. Obviously, you can help it out with Wish, but you know you can help Skarmory out with Wish too. Uh, so with Flory, it, it needs some help in the spin department. Uh, luckily, that's not unreasonable to do. Uh, and as a spiker, it does offer the advantages of being better as an anti anti spikes method, if we want to put it that way. Cloister. Okay, Cloyster is Magneton immune, so to speak, and uh, the problem is, of course, that it is affected by sand. So if you are trying to win a long game, if you're trying to get into a long game with your Spiker, then you run Skarm or Fory. Cloyster is for fast-paced offensive teams because it can also run, uh, oh, it can now run Rapid Spin and Explosion on the same set legally, whereas it can't in Gen 2, so that's nice. But it's running. It's used on fast-paced offensive teams where uh, you don't really need. It's more of a bonus. It's like, oh, if I can clear this layer of spikes, I will. But if not, not a big deal. So generally, it, it runs one set, a fast set with special defense investment. So you actually withstand Swampert's attacks uh, because that's the. Uh, and that's another reason why the spikers synergize so well with rocks and electrics. Uh, because the counters to those pokes, things like Swampert and Blissey, then Skarmory comes in on them and lays the spikes. So it's not like you have to do a, a merry dance to get the spiker in. No, you send that uh, spiker directly in on that poke, you get the spikes down, and then your po the next time this, uh, the counters are coming into the pokes, the rocks and electrics, then they're taking the spikes damage, and it's just lovely. Uh, something like Starmie is similar uh, in this regard, because... Levitating or flying Starmie counters, uh-uh, because it's got that, you know, strong ice beam, and the, it's got bolt beam combination. So, yeah, uh, and something like specially defensive Celebi does not want to switch into it with spikes and sand. Uh, gotta mention that sand is really crucial for, I mean, it would spikes would be great even without it, but it, it's what really makes it stick and what makes games a lot more fast-paced. What makes, what makes teams have the capacity to crumble so quickly? Anyway, speaking of uh, a quick pace, then here's Cloyster. Uh, so, yeah, fast pace, rocks, electrics, Gengar. Oh, and Gengar, obviously. But that's so obvious. But Gengar has his own section, at least. So, um, yeah, spikes, spin, boom, ice beam, or surf. You can drop a spin if you want for uh, the second stab. Some players even like HP Grass went and Focus Punch po uh, Swampert was popular because Swampert would think, oh, well, Cloyster has a free spike, so I'm going to Focus Punch it here, and Cloyster would punish it with HP Grass. Pretty cool, not really necessary. You can do that with Surf if you want and still have other moves, or Ice Beam. But yeah, uh, you pretty much get it in, and you get the spikes down, and you outrun a lot of stuff. Uh, a lot of even... Because a lot of offensive pokes in advance still aren't that fast. Like in GSC, where Exeggutor is one of the most popular, or Machamp, they're both some of the most popular offensive Pokemon, but they're not really that fast. And here you have the same thing with things like uh, Metagross or T-Tar, which Cloyster gets the jump on. So that's why another reason why it likes to run like max speed, because you get the jump on even the fastest T-Tar around. So, yeah, you spike, and then later you boom, and you... Yeah. For longer games, oh, Glacier also has the benefit of completely destroying Claydol, which is nice. But Claydol teams like to play the long game, and in an offensive t with an offensive team against a team looking to play the long game, you better have that offense to back it up because it's not enough to just have spikes because Claydol is not affected by spikes. So you got to have that offense that really rips into it from every direction. Uh, Glacier's biggest nemesis is, of course, once again Starmie which now is natural cure, so you can't even sneak a Toxic on it and try to play the long game. Not that you would, because in GSC, uh, then even offensive teams can very easily play the long game with rest talk and lack of sand and only one layer of spikes. Whereas in advance, then offensive teams are not nearly as well equipped to play the long game. Oh, and uh, EVs are no longer maxed out, so you're not taking hits as well. So, yeah, offensive teams got to play fast, 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 fast. So when uh, Cloyster faces Bulky Starmie, that can be a massive pain. Generally, you, yeah, it's a, it's not it's not fun. 
but uh, Bulky's Army is also a fairly rare choice, so most games Cloyster is going to get that spike, and it is going to th at least threaten a boom. Uh, so, yeah, it's fairly simple in that regard. It's like a more aggressive Skarmory and Fory that... It also doesn't have as much... Because in GSC, it got by on its raw bulk, and now that its raw bulk doesn't work as well because it can't fully invest... Because it, it doesn't have max DVs anymore, and it wants to be fast. It needs to be fast, even, I would argue. Uh, I'm sure you could use a slow cloister, but, I mean... Anyway, uh, so it needs to be fast, it doesn't have that maxed out bulk, and it doesn't have... So it can't get by on pure bulk, and it doesn't have the resists that Skarm and even Fori have. So it, it has a tougher time switching in. But, I mean, there are bulky waters everywhere, so let's not over-exaggerate. And uh, bulky grounds as well. So it's just not as nigh automatic as in GSC, where you could, you know, leave it in on a cl an Exeggutor Giga Drain or a Machamp Explo or, uh, Explosion, a uh, Cross Chop, and yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's Cloister for you. Uh, we have the rarest of the spikers. Once again, Smeargle, it can do a million things. It's just like in GSC. Spore spikes, and then I like Will O Wisp. Uh, you can do T Wave. Uh, you can do stab explosion, but it doesn't really. It's uh, there's no consensus. You can sub down to Salak and then you know Destiny Bond or something. Taunt is probably a one of the better choices, so things can't spike alongside you. Uh, Smeargle is the fastest spiker. That's very cool. And um, yeah, that, that's the so early game. I mean, with Smeargle, I mean you might not get the spikes down, but at least you know the opponent's not going to, because, yeah, unless they've got their own Smeargle, maybe. Oh, that's a mess. Smeargle on Smeargle lead matchups. An underrated weird way to use Smeargle is actually to not lead with it, because then you're leaving a lot to the chance of the lead matchup, whereas you can do things like Baton Pass Zapdos, which forces in a slower counter, like Blissey, Spadef Jirachi, Claydol, Celebi, and uh, Smeargle comes in and on those with Aplomb, and Spores and Spikes away. Uh, it's not much in the way of... Well, I mean, it, you can make it do whatever you want it to do, but it's not hitting hard, and with things like Refresh to Shrug Off Status, uh, or Natural Cure in this case, a Starmie, then you can't really guarantee that you're going to permanently cripple the uh, spinner trying to remove the spikes, but that's why you treat it like Cloister. So you temporarily maintain those spikes and then have an offensive supporting cast that just rips through everything. So that's Smeargle, fairly simple. Okay, so now we get to the non-spikers. So I'm using uh, the box for this. So the number one thing is Gengar. And for a long time, uh, like when Advance was in Smogan Tour, again, it's a history of Advance, coming soon to a YouTube near you, uh, then Gengar was thought of as obligatory in, uh, on Spike's teams. And it didn't used to be in old Advance, and here's why. In old Advance, on Net Battle, people didn't bother with Rapid Spin as much. Uh, number one, because they, the Rapid Spinners were not considered as good. And uh, number two, the Pokemon that were immune to... They, they preferred to deal with Spikes rather than dedicating a Pokemon to try and blow them away. Then, as the metagame progressed, then we found ways that these Pokemon could be useful besides just spinning, obviously. But at the time, there was also a, a thing where... Uh, Substitute on net battle blocked rapid spins a hazard clearing effect. So, and as a result, things like sub Titar, the veteran love set, Viltar, uh, or sub Flygon, uh, some players even use sub Skarmory to block rapid spin. So, there really was very little point in spinning a lot of the time. Can you imagine if that mechanic had stayed, by the way? That'd be insane. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, so spinning was very rare in uh, advance uh, at that time, and Gengar was still used, and sometimes even used on Spikes teams. But as uh, G80 once explained it to me, he was like, "Yeah, they used Gengar because it was a good Pokemon, not because it blocked Rapid Spin." And uh, as Advance came back to Smogan Tor, then uh, and Fortress used to be very rare, and then Forest came back in a big way and started spinning, and then the metagame was all... Skarmory, if you can believe it, there was a period of time where Skarmory was the lesser seen spiker. And that's because it was all about the Fori and the Pursuit Tar and the Gengar and the Calmine Blissey <laughs> and other stuff. 
Um, I'm reminiscing. That's decade plus at this point. Point being, people were fo were obsessed with Gengar and Spikes because it blocked rapid spin, and of course, it was a great, great uh, Spikes abuser because. Even with the prominence of specially defensive Rest Talk Zapdos at that time, since Rest Talk was still thought to function like it did, uh, like, like it didn't reset sleep. It, for those who don't know, Gen 3 Rest Talk, if you don't commit to staying in, if you just sleep talk and switch out, you may as well have not burned a sleep turn. You, it's kind of similar to Gen 5, and it's awful, and it killed Rest Talk. Not entirely, not fully, there will be another video. Oh, well, can you still use Rest Talk in advance? And the answer is yes, but not. A, it's not as ubiquitous as it used to be. Uh, Rest Talk's Zapdos used to be a metagame staple. Now it's kind of like, oh, that's underrated. So that was the closest thing to a Spikes Immune Gengar counter that there was, and it still wasn't really a Gengar counter. So Gengar switch-ins were affected by Spikes. And thus, it was uh, a lot of games where get up your spikes, abuse with Gengar, do a dance around that, around the Pursuit Tar, around the Blissey, around the arrow that threatens to sweep you in return late game. Of course, then uh, there were progressions like, oh, well, I'm going to, uh, we have these spinners and uh, clay it all, and Starmie was the most popular one for a long time. Uh, it's like, hey, we have these spinners that hit Gengar with a super effective stab psychic. So, you know, let's, and, uh, so let's start using those. Uh, and when that happened, then the metagame shifted a little, uh, which probably would have at some point anyway, just because it, even when a Pokemon is spammed for a reason, you always want to see if there is an alternative. Uh, and there, there were some alternatives. It's just that, why use Gengar, why not use Gengar on a Spikes team? Like, what else are you going to be abusing those Spikes with? Because, like, what abuses Spikes better than Gengar, which also protects them? It was a perfect match. Obviously, there are many other great Spikes abusers, and it became, it, it's not about having the best Spikes abuser, it's about what synergizes best for that team. Like, if, uh, like the double electric attack of Zapdos and Jolteon, then sometimes, yeah, you're going to have a tough time fitting Gengar onto that. Uh, not always, though, and it's just, it's delightful alongside them. But it's restrictive and, you know, because there's only six slots on a team and so on. So, uh, yeah, Gengar started being used less, and then it started being used more, and we started seeing slower and slower Gengars with uh, more special defense investment to live Pursuit Tar and to live Starmie Psychic. And uh, you could couple this with uh, things like uh, Drill Peck Skarm to Stuff Claydol. So it wasn't uh, either Gengar blocks the spin or Claydol sits on me forever. No, you had to shift away from that. Because Claydol, and I guess we're kind of in the Claydol section now too. Because uh, when Geng when Toxic Protect Skarmory was just dominating everything, people were like, okay, I'll use Refresh Claydol and sit on it forever. And if your Skarmory is blanked by that Claydol, then it's pretty much, okay, well, either Gengar blocks this thing, and I dance around it by pivoting to Starmie, or whatever it is I do, and it was hard to do so, then uh, I guess I need to, then I just guess I won't have spikes. And a lot of teams were falling into the trap of having no offense without spikes, like not having anything threatening without spikes, not being able to put any sort of pressure on opposing teams without spikes. So that led to a shift of A, uh, having Skarmory sets that were able to actually do something to Clay at all, i.e. Drill Peck. And as soon as Skarmory could actually do damage to Clay at, uh, Clay at all, refresh Clay at all, started dropping. The point being, when the most popular uh, anti-Scar method was... And I should preface this by saying, look, it, your team shouldn't just ignore the existence of OU Pokemon in general. But there are trends, and, uh, and it helps us explore the options more. Uh, so, yeah. And you can adjust your team based on... Uh, you, you get what I'm saying, but I wanted to include it, because I really hate when people go, Oh, well, you know, Metagross isn't trending right now. Which is an actual sentence people say. Metagross isn't trending right now, so I can afford to be a little weak to it. It's like, are, are you crazy? Come on. Uh, and that's why it's best to have a well-rounded team, blah, blah. But you also want to explore things, and uh, you get my point. Uh, also, Cacturn was quite a good spiker before it was banned, but it needed to be banned because Sandvale was stupid, and I have a video about that too. You can go check that out. You can go check out all my videos, because they're all awesome. Uh, so, 
yeah, Skarmory started being able to hit Clay at all with Drill Peck, and th therefore it started being able to spin block for itself, as the term was. And people were wondering, well, if Skarmory's spin blocking for itself, I don't really need Gengar to spin block for me, and so I can experiment with other Pokemon. I can start messing around with, uh, you know, other Spikes abusers. You know, you, you could still use Gengar, uh, obviously, because it was a great Spikes abuser, but you weren't beholden to doing so for the sake of protecting your Spikes. So, uh, yes, that is uh, that was one shift... Or that was that was the shift pretty much. Yeah, and Clay, then Claydol stopped using Refresh as much and started thinking, oh, well, maybe I should start using Explosion so I can actually check things and not just be a passive anti-spikes blob. Uh, that's where we are today. So, uh, yeah. Then, yeah, th then there's the, the Bulky Starmie of it all because in 2013, Bulky Starmie popped up and started... Spinning those spikes away, having a lot of longevity, and then it was realized, oh, well, if you're just aggressive with your Skarm, then you will outlast this thing. But then when Skarm st stopped running Toxic as much, and started running Drill Peck more, then Bulky Starmie came back. And uh, these kinds of things are cyclical, but with a well-built team, you shouldn't just go, oh, well, this thing showed up, so there goes my entire strategy. Uh, cause you, uh, especially because you don't need to in advance. I realize this is a little off topic, but I think it's relevant because of how we're talking at length about the cyclical nature of these things. Uh, so, but this is how we've progressed. And Bulky Starmie at first was like timid, really fast, faster than Max Speed Gengar, uh, and uh, at, at the very least faster than Adam and Dugtrio, or, and a little faster than that because faster offensive Gengars wouldn't go Max Speed usually, unless you're Dexa. I miss Dexa, he was great. Uh, but, um, they would go like faster than Adam and Dugtrio, and you outspeed that. Max special attack, so your psychic kills the Gengar. And uh, then over time, they got bulkier and bulkier. And then eventually, uh, they started running bold. And uh, they were kind of like Milotic esque in a sense, in that they had that like that longevity, except they also clear spikes. And they didn't need to instead of wasting a slot on refresh to be anti toxic and anti will o wisp, then they had natural cure for that, so they could clear spikes instead. And they also spread uh, paralysis. So Bulky Starmie was more than just an anti-spikes poke. Uh, it was a great, like it was a great Metagross answer. That's an incredible trait to have for a team. But and the best part is, since it's not a true bulky water, then you would have other answers to physical things. So if Metagross blows up on your Starmie, then it's not blowing up on your answer to DD Mence, for example, uh, or your Zapdos, i.e., your answer to DD Gara. So it was a great way of dividing and conquering. Uh, offensive teams and combinations uh, in addition to being a great anti-spikes poke. And uh, that was just defensive Starmie too, because uh, another variant of Spin Starmie was of course offensive Spin Starmie, Hydro Bolt Beam Spin. Now a lot of the teams that were using that kind of Starmie, the Spikes abusers themselves, they didn't really rely on it to spin because they didn't say, okay, well Starmie is my rapid spinner in the sense that I'm expecting it to clear spikes over and over throughout a game because it's so frail and doesn't have recover so it's not going to have much in the way of longevity at all in fact it, it's famously impossible to take a hit with uh, offensive starmie but if you can pull it off it can be a great way to alleviate pressure uh, and I, I forget what game this was I, th I think it was UD versus Dice in the World Cup of Pokemon 2017, which is a perfect example of this. Because uh, Dice, I think, had a Blissey or a Regice, and Starmie wasn't going to be sweeping immediately, and Dice was putting on the pressure with uh, Spikes plus Mixmens, and UD got his Starmie in and managed to clear the Spikes, and that was huge. Because whatever guys it's in, Starmie's hard to spin block. Claydol, yeah, stab psychic, but whatever. But it's also a hard, it's slow and it's not very strong. Starmie is fast and strong, so it's hard to spin block. Uh, I realize I haven't mentioned Dusclops and Miss Dravis, but that's because they're honorable mentions that we'll get to. Uh, yeah, so even offensive Starmie with, and so I say all that like, it wasn't relied on to spin to say that sometimes it ran Psychic in that fourth move slot, or even HP Grass because Swampert is deceptively decent in one on one against Starmie. Not that you should use it as a counter, but you know, especially when Asta started using a uh, specially defensive Swampert. So uh, yeah, HP Grass was actually quite good, uh, and Hit Lantern, yeah, 
people who know what Lantern does, they know what Lantern does. Uh, is my music still playing? Yes, there we go. Uh, so, yeah, point being that Starmie was more of uh, Spike's abuser on those like big five, Titar, Scar, and Pert, Bliss, Gar teams, uh, especially because Gengar wasn't going to abuse Spike's all by itself, because that team tended to be Gengar plus a bunch of slow walls, so you want to have some more offensive pressure, and Starmie's like the ultimate cleaner, and Gengar synergizes really well with it, you know, baits in Blissey, weakens it, you know, generally softens up the opposing team, like Zapdos and Celebi into Starmie range, so that Starmie can do what it do, does best, which is come in and just outspeed and Oko things left and right. This has such incredible, super effective coverage, speed, power, all that. So, uh, but you can still fit Rapid Spin on that set, just because you're not... In most cases, you're not going to have something better, and it can still help out a lot. So, but uh, if you're running offensive Starmie, first and foremost, a Spikes Abuser, but it's a Spikes Abuser that can also help you out with Spikes, and that's amazing. So, uh, we'll mention the other ghosts. Dust Clops used to be used in the old days of Advance, but slow and affected by Spikes and Sand, so not winning any awards in longevity. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, this is not directly Spikes. Spikes relevant in terms of the Spikes game, as in Skarm primarily used uh, Spikes to, or Drill Peck to handle Fortress and Gang, and, uh, and Claydol, because those directly threaten its spiking, uh, i.e. its reason for being. But another huge benefit of Drill Peck was that it hit Gengar, because uh, Spikes, Whirlwind, Toxic, Sand, you know, that hits a, a lot of stuff, you know, most of the metagame. And uh, Spikes and Toxic, it's a lot, right? So Gengar is immune to both. So when you have that uh, traditional Protect Toxic Skarmory, then you are able to... Uh, by the way, some people didn't want to give up on Protect or Toxic uh, on Skarm, and they started running uh, Whirlwindless Skarm, which is a great set. You have to take advantage... You have to really build your team around it, because not being able to phase out Metagross is really, really bad if you don't prepare for it. But being able to run all of Protect, Toxic, and Drill Peck is incredible. So you dominate Bulky Starmie and you hit Claydol and Fori and all this other stuff. You can do similar things with Taunt if you want. Point being, Skarm is endlessly customizable. So uh, back to Drill Peck Skarm and Gengar. So yeah, Gengar used to, you know, Skarm used to be one of its favorite targets because it completely blanked that Protect Toxic set. So it was related to Spikes in that, oh, well, I want to get Gengar in as much as possible. All right, well, Skarm's in. I'm going to pivot in on that Toxic and now harass the opposing team. And with Drill Peck, then you go from never being able to do any damage to Gengar at all. The most you can do is Whirlwind and hope to drag in something that's affected by Spikes, which often was the case. But in terms of actually being able to hurt Gengar, you can't. You, you have to hope it's stupid enough to taunt you. <laughs> And even then, because uh, as soon as Gengar dips below 100%, then it starts being in KO range for stuff. But but the whole point was that with Skarm's Protect Toxic set being so prominent, Gengar often was at 100% because it completely blanked it and came in so often. And then with Drill Peck, even uninvested Drill Peck against, you know, bulky Gengar. Bulky Gengar is bulky because it can take one hit you wouldn't expect it to take, not because it takes hits repeatedly. So as soon as it gets chunked by that Drill Peck, I mean, that's just enormous. And, uh... That was a, another big shift. Not directly, because it doesn't uh, change the Spikes War, because Skarm is not running Drill Peck to help it get Spikes better, but it more to, as a bonus, it limits how well opposing Gengar can limit uh, can uh, come in on it and abuse Spikes. So that was a big one. Okay, so Dust Claps, and uh, we saw some Misdravis in the days of old too, because it also has Levitate, and we've been seeing some of it recently, I believe. But uh, it's very niche, only for the most hardcore of stall teams, because it has nothing in the way of uh, offensive capability. So now we're just going to skim over some other great Spikes abusers. Uh, we've mentioned the Rocks, DD, Tar, and Arrow, the most classic combo. I mean, that's just classic, the most classic form of Spikes offense. You get your Spikes, you make sure you don't get cleaved open by opposing, you know, offensive stuff, and then you just load up on your DD, Tar, your Arrow, your Gengar is already there. If you can throw in an Electric, that's even better. So yeah, but Arrow is the most classic because, and that's why Claydol and Flygon and Bulky Flygon, uh, one of my favorite inventions, is are, are so good because they are so rare in that they are able to handle Arrow's Rock Slide and Sand and Spikes. Uh, so I mean, even Skarmory, immune to Sand and Spikes, doesn't take a Rock Slide so well. I mean, I'm not saying try to cleave through a healthy Skarmory with your Arrow because then you're gonna get toxic and then good night. But uh, over time, then yeah, 
Um, so arrow is a big one. And we also have the inverse effect because you would say, oh, well, isn't everything a spikes abuser? The answer, not really. Because if you look at Gyarados and Heracross, their answers are things like uh, Zapdos, Aerodactyl, uh, Zapdos, Aerodactyl, Salamence. I mean, how is Spikes helping Gara or Hera at all? I mean, yes, okay, obviously, uh, Gara likes extra Spikes damage to help uh, put Metagross in range for its Earthquake. Heracross doesn't mind the extra bit of damage, also on Metagross, actually, uh, for its Megahorn. But it's not really, you know, you want things more using things like Ice and Rock and Electric Coverage because it hits those Flying types and uh, also one of the most common Levitators, uh, Flygon. And if you can hit Gengar at all, then, you know, it's... Uh... But things like Super Rachi with Psychic, you know, that's also hitting a Spikes Immune Pokemon uh, super effectively. And uh, the others, you know, like Salamence and... Because a lot of the flying types are not paragons of longevity and bulk, like Salamence or Arrow. Like, even bulkier Zapdos. So as long as you can hit them hard, then, uh, then the rest will follow because then you can... Uh, uh, sp use spikes to double switch around Blissey. I mean, that, that's the most classic thing in the world. Uh, Blissey comes in, takes damage from Spike, Zapdos, Baton passes out. I mean, replace that Zapdos with uh, Gengar using Taunt to prevent uh, it from soft boiling, or just Jirachi uh, provoking it to come in and then double switching. So, uh, Jolteon, another example. See, it's mostly about the coverage. But uh, even something like Moltres, which doesn't have super effective coverage against any of the flyers, but you look at its matchups against the flying types of the tier, and you see, oh, well, none, or like Charizard, and, uh, well, Charizard doesn't have will o so it doesn't threaten Arrow as much, uh, or Gera, or, yeah, but point being, they're still not eager to switch into it, they don't love it. Uh, I was going to say Mets, but it likes Stratic and Claw. But yeah, uh, so Moltres and Zard, then... Uh, they threaten the flying types of the tier quite well, so it's not just about hitting them super effectively with, you know, ice or electric or rock, but just about having a good matchup against them. And of course, Moltres and Charizard are excellent because they're Spikes abusers that are immune to Spikes themselves. I mean, that's just beautiful. Mix Salamence, another lovely, lovely example. And then, uh, so like Starmie and Titar, of course. Titar can do it all. And Zapdos. And then there are some lower tier pokes, but uh, lower tier pokes generally are not as spikes reliant. Is, uh, I mean, Venusaur is a notable exception, but you know, you notice other things like Weezing, and then they're a lot more independent in their offense. So, uh, of course, there are plenty of good ones. Okay, so I think that wraps up the Gen 3 uh, component of spikes, and therefore part 2 of our history of spikes. So, thank you for watching. I hope this was enjoyable and informative for you. And just uh, just for fun, uh, I realize that this video did not have much of a visual component at all. So, uh, I will give you a replay that I... Uh, I, I don't know. I wanted to highlight the Pokemon on the screen as I was talking about them. As it helps just a little. But there is a very funny old replay uh, that I, it's of a game I had about four years ago, and, well, let me just say it's, it's amusing, and it has to do very much with spikes and spike immunities, so it, it's not an endless game, that's not it at all, don't worry, it's actually fun to watch, so thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and the pinned comment will have that very fun replay, and I will see you guys in part three, or whatever the next video I make is.